Hey guys, um, today we're going to do some heavier lifting. Not the heaviest lifting, but heavier. Um, we will be discussing cord extension. And you must bear in mind that we're talking about cord extension within the first level of music theory, which would be uh, the isolated keys, also known as the Greek modes. Okay. All you have to think of it is we're working within one key without the influence of any other keys. Uh, but before I get started on this concept, uh, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude and thanks to Andy and Steve, who uh, uh, Andy uh, donated to my Patreon account. I think that's forward slash Vincognito. I'm not even sure if the Patreon is working, but thanks, Andy. We'll see how I can get this all going. And uh, Steve, who, uh, thank you so much, man. Uh, he sent me a tip. Uh, and uh, also, a nice little uh, read for me, Bob Dylan's Chronicles. I have not read this, and it's awesome. I'm, I'm as I spoke about before, uh, there were three major influences in, in the 60s uh, popular music, uh, two of them being uh, the British Invasion and then the um, Motown influence. And now the third influence is the music of Greenwich Village, the folk music of Greenwich Village. And... I'm sure Bob is going to be talking about those times. He is a super genius. I mean, he's a true poet, and he deserved the Nobel Prize for Literature. I think he should have gotten the Nobel Peace Prize for blowing in the wind, quite honestly. I've said that for years before he even got the Nobel. Anyway, so, yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, really wonderful. I mean, nice. It was like Christmas morning for me to get those in the mail. So, in, in any case, um, we're going to talk about chord extension uh, and first, uh, if, you, if you looked at um, the chord family template, how chords are built, and secondly, uh, um, intervals, and I spoke about how certain intervals actually sing together nicely, and in that category would be the interval called the third. So if I have this melody, and I harmonize it in thirds, I get a, they sing together very nicely. Given that, and given um, uh, when I spoke about the chord family template, that chords are built in thirds. They skip a note of the scale and go to the next, skip a note of the scale and go to the next. At one point, composer said, well, if these intervals sing together, why can't I pop even more and more thirds on top? And yeah, that's quite doable. This is what we... Uh, we look at as what they call jazz chords. Um, they're not exclusive to jazz, certainly. Uh, every once in a while, the Beatles used an extended chord. Um, uh, the six nine chord was one they used to end songs to get that kind of, it's kind of corny now. Um, so the six nine is an extended chord, and it shouldn't be called a six nine, but we'll talk about that. In any case, uh, all right. Chord extension, stacking more and more thirds on top of a chord, probably, probably began to happen in the late Romantic era when composers were getting more and more restless and they wanted richer, thicker chord sounds. And indeed, the effect of stacking thirds on a chord tends to soften it. It tends to make it pillowy and lush and um, it hides a multitude of sins. Like, for example, in the future I'll talk about the tritone substitution chord, which uh, within the context of what would have been a 2-5-1, say D minor, D flat 7, to C. If you notice that D flat 7 is a little harsh, but if I extend these chords D minor into D minor 9, uh, D flat 7 into D flat 9, and C major into C major 7, now we get something nice. And also, if I want to follow the line which is going down, if any of you guys are subscribers to James Corbett for his, um, his membership videos, I just recently did um, an analysis of the Beatles' You Won't See Me. And he, chose, he couldn't have chosen a better song. That song discusses lines, which is basically what I'm talking about here. And uh, you get more of a take on lines if you were to see that video. However, if you look at some of my videos in the playlist Music Theory for Guitar or uh, the Fragments of Infinity videos, uh, actually, I haven't hit lines yet in Fragments of Infinity. What is a line? 
just real short, uh, it's a series of notes that go down or up in sequence. So uh, when I do D minor 9, my top note is E. When I do D9, my top note is E flat. But when I go to C major 7, I go back up to E. So I'm getting... Well, what if I wanted this to keep going down? Well, yeah. If I stack my C major 7 into a C major 9, and don't worry about the chord names yet, we'll, we're going to get into that today. Now we have, all right, very lush, very jazz, very loungy. That is the tendency of stacked thirds. All right, um, so yeah, uh, these these kinds of chords were introduced into classical music, like I said, probably late Romantic, but they were really exploited by people like Ravel and even Claude Debussy in the um, Impressionist period. There's a Ravel piece called uh, uh, Pavan for a Dead Princess, happy title, but he does a sequence of ninth chords going down in whole steps. You could hear it... it it has that rich jazzy tone. So let's not relegate extended chords to just jazz. They, they are used in all uh, different forms. All right, now, when we stack chords, we run into a problem that none of academia seems to have noticed. And it's a problem that I call the minor ninth rule. The minor ninth, I will get into this just that we're going to bump into this problem, and when you extend chords, you always bump into this problem in one way or another, extending chords. So you have to do a little detective work to fix the element. Now, in classical music, they've said that the tritone interval is the devil's interval by virtue of its dissonance. But actually, the minor ninth, to me, is the true uh, devil's interval. The tritone interval is magical what it could do, and it's so useful in music. Why ascribe that to the devil? Devil, But the minor ninth um, is so, it's cacophonous to my ear. And I'll explain that in a little bit. Uh, the minor ninth will come up, and I will talk about it. But first, let's talk about chord extension. So, Here's my chart. Now, if you look at the Roman numeral 1 going across, you see we have a C scale. And as usual, if we look at uh, the root 3rd and 5th, we get C major, C, E, G. But then we could hop another 3rd. And when we hop up there, we get what's called C major 7. Not C7, that's important, because there's a distinction between a 7th and a major 7th. A 7th is also known as a dominant 7th, a very important chord. And uh, the major seventh distinguishes itself as a major chord as opposed to the dominant chord, which is definitely a seventh chord. However, this is technically in the realm of a seventh chord in the sense that you're using four notes, a root, a third, a fifth, and a seventh. Don't call it seventh. Call it major seventh. Real important. All right, so now I've stacked up root, third, fifth, seven, and I got C, E, G, B. And then I go to nine, and... Uh, I get D, right? Now I could stack up to a C major 9. But you'll notice the F, the 11th, uh, is in red. That's a verboten interval that will totally ruin the quality of the chord, okay? It will no longer... When the minor ninth comes into play, which that is, and uh, I'll explain in a sec. When the ninth, minor ninth comes into play when you're extending chords, uh, what happens is it robs the chord of its mellow quality. Remember I said when you stack thirds, it has a fluffy, pillowy, kind of mellow, jazzy, loungy quality. As soon as you drop that F on top, it ruins the whole thing. Now, unfortunately, it's not easy for me to build a C major 9 with an F on top, but I'll do my best. Let's see if there's a way to do this. This is C major 9. Yeah, I could somehow do it by barring over, but that's nice. But then we get this F note. Ugly, all right? C major 9, beautiful, works great. So uh, what if we were to skip the F? And then... From there, instead of jumping thirds, we just tack on this 13th all the way up at top there, 
right? C major 9, add 13, which is the proper name for it, by the way. And uh, this is what we get. This is C major 13. Also pillowy, fluffy, loungy. So if I stick that F in there, it ruins the chord, okay? This is the minor ninth. This is the true devil's interval. It, it comes in and destroys whatever is really nice and pretty about the chord. Okay, and unfortunately, this problem crops up over and over and over again. When we're dealing with uh, um, uh, chord extension. Now, I'm going to give you an example, and this is what pisses me off about what they taught me in college. None of these guys investigated beyond what they were told. You know, everybody's a parrot. They just repeat what what's been parroted to them. Nobody seems to investigate this stuff. Um, so, how I discovered the minor ninth rule, and this is my rule, they don't teach you this in music school, how I discovered it was one day my jazz uh, harmony teacher said when you build a major seven chord make sure the major seventh note is above the root or else it won't sound good. Okay, let me demo that for you. Here I have a chord built in exact thirds, which is rare for guitar, but this one can be built in thirds. Root, this is G major 7. I have root, third, fifth, major 7. Now what he said was keep the major 7th where my first finger is pointing above the root where my pinky is pointing. Now what if we reverse the roll? What if I put the major 7 below and the root above? Let me do that. No longer sounds fluffy and pillowy. That's the real major 7 sound. This is the destroyed major 7 sound by virtue of the minor ninth. Now, question. Why is, what is a minor ninth? A minor ninth is merely an octave and a half step tacked onto it. Also, you can count up the scale to nine steps. One, two, if I start on this F sharp, remember these are the offending notes. Ugly. So, uh, by the way, I want to make a side note here. I've I've used this word ugly for this interval, and I've had more than one student tell me, oh, it's not ugly to me, I kind of like it. Fine and dandy, that's great. But if you want the quality of a major seven that's all loungy and soft and pillowy, you're not going to get it from this. It doesn't work. It's sour. It's ugly. All right, now, if I count from my F sharp my up to my other offending note, the G, I get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine counting up the G major scale F sharp to G now again when I raise the F sharp up to G and by the way it's a minor ninth but like if you were to take this boil it down to its smallest uh, uh, distance it would simply be a half step because F sharp and G are right next to each other and that's part of the reason for the the dissonance okay now I'm not saying this interval is always bad it can actually be very lovely inside of some chord shapes but it needs to be buried somewhere in the middle for it to actually have that, um, it's almost like a bittersweet quality it evokes. But standalone, not very pretty, right? All right, now, so, uh, what was I talking about? All right, so if now, again, if I take this F sharp and raise it up, and if I take this G in the higher octave and lower it, I get this chord, and there we go, voila, it's beautiful, sounds nice. Now, that's all they told me in music school. But then when I started trying to invert chords, and I'll give you examples right now. Um, the minor ninth, there's a chord called a minor ninth, different than the minor ninth interval. Uh, it's built up to, it's a minor chord and it's built up to its ninth, slightly different than the intervalic name. And I warned you about that, that the chord names and interval names are different entities. All right, here's a E minor nine, very pretty chord. invert this chord in such a way now uh, where my uh, potentially offensive notes are are the G here and the F sharp here just like in our G major 7 both the same notes now if I take now bear in mind these chords will have the same exact, exact notes either way when I change the G to an F sharp and the F sharp to a G I still have the same four notes they're just in different octaves now now listen to uh, E minor 9 with the F sharp below and the G above it doesn't, it 
it could be used for effect, don't get me wrong, but what I'm saying is if you want the quality, the soft, uh, loungy quality of a minor 9, you cannot invert it that way. It sounds like crap. Here's another good example, the, the blues sharp 9 chord, E7 sharp 9. Here we have the root, the third, the flat 7, and the sharp 9. Right? Now, if I, the, the distance, here's the distance that can create the really offensive interval. And again, I could lower this and raise this and get the exact same notes in different octaves. So uh, I could lower this G sharp to a G and raise the G to a G sharp. Now I get this. Not quite what Jimi Hendrix would have wanted. Right? Alright, so there are a number of chords uh, that are extended that run into this problem called the minor ninth. I'll deal with it even in more detail when um, we get into four note chord theory for guitar and um, uh, when we get into the major minor key system. But just bear this in mind, you can't arrange the notes haphazardly. They have to go in a specific placement when the minor ninth shows up. Otherwise, all is well. I mean, you could, if you don't get a minor ninth, you're fine. And you're going to see from the chord family template that some chords don't have this problem when you extend them. So let's take a look. The first chord up here is uh, C major, and you notice the Roman numeral one. This is the Ionian step, the first step of the scale upon which we could build a chord. And of course, we have our basic triad, root, third, fifth. Then we stack on the major seven. Then we stack on the nine. We ignore the 11 because it creates that offensive sound, and then we get the 13. And I showed you what that chord sounds like. It's really lush. Now, if you notice, when we go to the second chord of the key of C, the two chord, which is the Dorian step, and this is, in a sense, you could call this the Dorian chord in one sense. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Rick Beato does that on his channels. He has full chords that express an entire mode. That can be done. All right, now, um, here we have a D minor chord. Now, we're going to run into a problem in a second, uh, but it looks like there's no problem. There's no red here. You don't see the minor, uh, minor ninth problem coming up, and it's true. So what we have is uh, D is the root, F is the flat 3, A is the 5. Then we extend, and that when we extend it to the 7, it's called D minor 7. When we extend up to the ninth, it's called D minor 9. When we extend up to the 11, it's called D minor 11. And you might notice now, in the minor chord, the 11th isn't a problem because it doesn't create a minor ninth interval, all right? Um, it, it creates, uh, the problem would have been between the third and the 11th, the F to the G, but if you notice between F and G, if we look at them next to each other in the scale of seconds, F and G are a whole step apart, all right? So the whole step isn't nearly as dissonant as the half step is. Whole step, That's not too bad. That's bad, all right? That's the half step interval. So one thing you'll notice is D minor is one of these rare chords, at least if it's built from the second step of a, key, of a key, that it can be built all the way up to the 13th. Um, now, this is a case when you get to the 13th, uh, when we get into the deeper music theory, I'm gonna show you how this is actually when you add that 13th, it becomes a minor dominant chord. Another thing they don't talk about in music school. Now, if we move up to the third chord of the key of C, we get E minor. And this has double the problem. This is the only chord that has the problem twice. All right, so we have E, G, B. That gives you, uh, oh wait, I'm down here. E, G, B, that gives you E minor. Then uh, D, the flat seven. Then we get a minor ninth here, and uh, we get the um, E minor 11 here, and finally, that's, yeah. And finally, uh, the flat 13 over here, which creates uh, another minor ninth in, in here. But first, I, you know, before I move on, I have to explain something very, very important. You might say to you, if you look at this D minor, let's go back to D minor. You might say to yourself, 
uh, when I look at the third, it's called a flat three, but the note F is natural. It doesn't have a flat. And why is it called a flat three? This piece of information will be very useful uh, for you if you um, work with it, okay? Why are certain elements of a chord called flat or sharp or whatever? Or even a scale, um, if I did the D Dorian scale, when I go D, E, F, F is known as the flat three. Why is it called a flat three if it's just a mere F and there's no flat on it? The technique, the way of determining, determining the number intervals of a chord, of a scale, or even, uh, well, a chord or a scale, basically, uh, the way to determine the number intervals, whether they're flat or sharp, is to compare it to the major scale of the same root. Now, what does that mean? All right, I have a D minor chord. The root is D. And what I, I'm thinking of is the D major scale. If I compare a D minor chord to a D major scale, this is how you determine flat or sharps in the notes. Here we go. So what I have here is the D major scale up top, D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C, D. Um, below that, I have the D, the D minor extended chord all the way up to the 13th. Now, when we go to the third, you'll notice that in the D minor chord we have an F, but in the D major scale, it's F sharp. F is lowered by a half step. Now, F sharp is the third step of the key of D, and F is the third of the D minor chord. So uh, you'll see that the F moves down a half step. So if F sharp is three, F must be flat three. And it's that simple. Notice we also have a flat seven in the D minor chord. Well, if you look above that flat seven C note, you'll get a C sharp. So in comparison to a D scale, the D minor chord has a flatted seventh. All right, I hope that clears things up, and you can use that for any quarter scale to determine is this flat, is this sharp, whatever. Just compare to the root of a major scale. Oh, also at this junction juncture, I have to talk about uh, extension. There are two types of extension, okay? One is by properly stacking in thirds. So let's say uh, the D minor chord again. Uh, oh. D, F, A, C, E. So that's properly called a minor ninth, right? But if I take one of these upper extensions, which would include 7, 9, 11, and 13, those are called upper extensions of the triad, okay? When... Uh, what if I decided, well, I'm not going to put the, the flat 7 in the chord, but I'm going to chuck the 9 on, okay? That's called a D minor, add 9, all right? So uh, the difference in tone, actually, let's do it with a major chord because it's just easier for me. <laughs> um, let's say we have C major 7, so a C major 9, C, E, G, B, D. I stack all the way to the D note that's properly a D major 9. However, if I remove the 7th and just chuck the 9 on, it's called an add chord, A-D-D, an add 9. You're tacking it on, you're just throwing it onto the chord. Uh, sometimes they use plus, which is really annoying, plus 9, because sometimes plus means sharp and sometimes plus means add. It's bullshit. I mean, the, the terminology in chord naming is just ridiculous. So, in any case, um, let me show you the difference between C major 9 sound and C add 9. Here's a C major 9 chord. Now this is built root 3rd major 7 um, 9. Notice there's no 5th in it. The 5th, when we get into 4 note chord theory, I'll explain to you why the 5th can be eliminated from a chord and the chord will still function. Um, but there's a C major 9. And uh, it's fully stacked, root third, fifth, seventh, nine. And remember, again, the fifth is implied. Don't worry about it. It's just implied there. Uh, if I were to build a true and proper C major nine, it couldn't be possible on the guitar. It's just the two, would take too many fingers to do it. 
well, maybe I could do it some way, but um, in any case, what is the sound of a C major add 9 as opposed to C major 9? Well, here's a C chord, and what I'm going to do is I have two C's in the chord, so I can eliminate one of them, and I'm going to drop a D on top of this high C note. This is C major 9. Um, it's a very pretty sound. It's often used in country music, and piano players love to throw that. They'll call it a second sometimes because it's next to the root. Second is incorrect language. This is the scale of thirds, not the scale of seconds. So this uh, this particular chord is root, fifth, ninth, third. Okay, that's a very pretty sound. Very different than the jazzy my, uh, major nine. So uh, that. Uh, now, you know, a lot of guys like the minor nine chord, which I demonstrated before, and you notice with the three step of the key, you cannot add that minor nine. It'll give you a flat nine rather than um, the minor ninth. Um, I'm, now I'm speaking minor ninth chord, not the interval. Okay, this is really tricky. Here's E minor nine. Uh, here's D minor nine. Here's A minor nine. All from the key of C, they sound nice. But when I extend up to the ninth on the E chord, I get an F note up top, which is a flatted ninth. Not nice chord. Doesn't have the pillowy. Now what jazz guys will do is they'll say, well, this is a flat nine. I'll just raise it to the ninth so it'll sound prettier. Well, the problem there is if you have the three chord in a song and the melody has an F note in passing, which is this, uh, this one up here, right? If the melody has an F note in passing and you play this, there's gonna be a clash between those two notes. All right, so you just can't arbitrarily um, uh, kind of fix the chord because you're adding a note from the other key and if the melody can't sustain that note, you're in trouble. Okay, jazzers love to do what's called the flatted fifth or otherwise known as the sharp 11 chord. All well and good. However, um, well, we'll hit the sharp 11 in a second actually, so let's just keep going. Uh, I could build a Z minor 9 all the way up to its 13th, but you get the idea. It'll sound like crap with those two chords. So when you build, extend an E minor chord, you can go, by the way, all the minor chords of a key definitely go up to the flat 7 with no problem, okay? In the E minor chord, you can't go up to the 9. Notice that the 11 sits okay here, but then we get this flat 13. So the most you could do to an E minor 7 is call it E minor 7 add 11, because why? We're not stacking, all right? We're just chucking that 11 chord. Uh, 11 note on and I'll show you what E minor add 11 sounds like uh, here's E minor 7 and the 11th is the A note beautiful sound really nice okay very rich very full all right so a, a certain degree of caution needs to be done when you're extending chords um, I'm gonna give you uh, well I'll keep going now if we go to the four chord of the key, here's a major chord that does not run into the minor ninth problem whatsoever. Uh, and uh, you'll notice that it has a sharp 11. All right, now again, uh, if I took the key of F, I'd get F, G, A, B flat, C, D, E, right? Well, this is a B natural, all right? So the 11th, which is equivalent to the fourth step in the scale of seconds, uh, the fourth in the key of F would be B flat. In the scale of thirds, uh, the eleventh would be B flat. But in this instance, in the key of C, we notice that we have a sharp eleven. Again, uh, using that system I showed you, if you compared the key of F with the notes of the F chord extended up to the sharp eleven, that's where we get the sharp from. The eleventh in the key of F is actually a B flat. But the 11th from the key of C is a B natural. So now, you know, there's a term they use, altered chords, and sharp 11 would fall into that category. Uh, altered chords I used to define as chords that, that, that tweak one of the notes and thereby bring in a note from another key. 
But in the case of F, you're not bringing in another, of, of, of another key. You're not really technically altering the chord. Um, so anyway, let me show you in context of the key of C what a sharp 11 would sound like. And don't worry about these guitar chord forms. I'm going to give you an amazing chart with an amazing set of rules that will make you, uh, make you uh, be able to do any of these chords, no matter, no matter the math, all over the neck of the guitar in different shapes and forms. Uh, my job as a teacher is not for you to mimic what I do. My job is to get you to be so independent that you'll discover things beyond what I've discovered. All right, so um, uh, here's the key of C. Okay, so now we have that in our ear, what that sounds like. When I go to F major 9, that's the sharp 11 on top. It's a very pretty chord. And you notice there's no argument with the key whatsoever. It seems to fit right in the key sonically. Why? Because B, that sharp 11, is natural to the key of C. Okay. So F major is, uh, along with its little sister, D minor, and they are related, those two chords, by the way, are the two chords that do not have a problem of a minor ninth. Now we move to the all-important essential, cool, mysterious, dominant seventh chord. Uh, here you see uh, G, B, D gives you the G major triad. Uh, then we have G, B, D, F gives you the flat seven. Why flat seven? Well, in a G major scale, the F note is sharp. All right, but in the key of C, that F note is natural. So when we compare that F note to the key of G, the F sharp, we're flatting that F sharp to an F. That's why it's called flat seven. Note we can extend to nine, no problem, but then the evil uh, minor 11th note uh, comes, uh, the uh, evil uh, 11th comes in, and uh, that creates the minor ninth problem, which uh, occurs between the third of the chord B and the 11th of the chord C. All right, so uh, let me see if I could demonstrate to you the horribleness of the 11th in this chord. First of all, we have a G7, then a G9, all right, nice enough chord. Now I'm going to, again, this is, chord is hard to, uh, to configure, I know, uh, I'll try to get it by barring over. That one doesn't happen to be so horrible, but it does take away from the softness of the uh, of the ninth chord. Um, then uh, with the five seven, we can extend up the thirteen by dropping the 11th. There's many things you could do to deal with the 11th in a dominant 7th chord. It's different than just a plain old major. One way to deal with it is to get rid of the 3rd, which gives you a, a, a G11, which is basically the same thing as a suspension. Uh, G11 Nice chord. Remember, the seventh chord wants to relax. So let's say I have C, G7, C, G7 relaxes back to C. Now, if I do the eleventh uh, chord without the third, notice it still relaxes, but it's much softer than the G7, which has that tritone interval up top. It's a very spicy interval. Um, another way to deal with the 11th is to keep the 3rd and eliminate the 11th. So if I were to build up to the 13, here's a G9, and I just pop the 13 on, that'll work. Now, in guitar land, if you take a G7 bar chord and you drop on this E note on the B string, 5th fret of the B string with your pinky, they call this a 13. Oh, sorry. And you hear that lush sound, but it's not a proper 13 chord. Why? Because it doesn't have the ninth. Okay? If I add the ninth, I have a proper 13 chord. But in the world of guitar, it's 
far as they're concerned, that's a 13th chord. Wrong. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, there is no such thing as a dominant chord called a 13th. It doesn't exist. If you build up to the 9, you have to skip the 11. So if you build up to the 9 and you want a 13th chord, you would call a G9 add 13 because you're tacking it on. You're not uh, doing thirds at that point. You're skipping the 11. Uh, in the case of the bar chord on guitar, which doesn't keep the ninth around, but just tacks on the 13, that would be called G7 add 13. So there is no such thing as a proper G13, a dominant chord called G13. There's either G7 add 13 or G9 add 13. You see why I have a problem with chord naming in music? Um, if you want a very specific, particular sound, you need the language to express it. If they're not using the proper language to express it, how am I to know? All right. Now, uh, here we get to the uh, relative minor chord, the relative minor key, some say, in the key of uh, the chord A minor, the sixth step, the Aeolian chord of the key of C. And you'll notice we can go pretty far with this chord before running into the uh, minor ninth problem. The problem there is we have a flat 13, and to avoid the minor ninth, you need a natural 13. Don't worry about it. it. It's just something the computer in my head happens to know. But you can build the minor chord ACE is A minor. ACEG is A minor 7. Uh, ACEGB is A minor 9. ACEGBD is A minor 11. Very pretty chord. And then when you add that 13th chord, it, uh, 13th note, it ruins it. You know the old saying, like, one bad apple will spoil the whole bunch? Anything with a minor ninth will ruin the entire chord. However, there's an exception to every rule. There is one chord that allows for the minor ninth, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, all right, so here's A minor 9. Uh, here's A minor, all right, here's A minor, right? Here's A minor 7, or, or, right? Here's uh, A minor 9, or here's A minor 11. That's beautiful. Now, I cannot, uh, I can't really grab the F, but here's the note. You can hear that note would not work in that chord. All right, so again, the minor ninth problem coming up. Did they teach the minor ninth rule in college, kids? No, they did not. Why didn't they? Because they're frickin' clueless, that's why. And they don't investigate scientifically into, into the uh, architecture of music itself. All right, uh, you know, I have a bunch more points I want to talk about. Ah, what the hell, I'll talk about it. Now, I'm going to give you the Christmas tree analogy. Remember, there are three chord types. There are major chords, minor chords, and dominant seventh chords, okay? That's all there are, okay? Uh, now, um, I want to give you an idea. If I, have, if I have a pine tree, all right, think of that as a triad. That's a C chord, a D minor chord, a G major chord, just a three-note chord. That's my pine tree. Now, if I extend up to, say, let's take a major chord as an example. I have, uh, uh, actually, let's, let's do the F major chord since it allows for all the notes. Um, if I have FAC, that's the pine tree. If I build up another third FACE, F major 7, that's like putting bulbs on the tree. If I build up to 9 FACEG, uh, that's like putting tinsel on. Uh, if I built up to... Uh, the sharp 11 F A C E G uh, B that's like putting tinsel on the tree and then finally up to the 13th F A C E G B D that's like putting a star on top of the tree now I have to ask you this question is the tree different than it was in the sense of its essential nature as being a tree no it's still a tree it's still a pine tree it still functions as a pine tree Yes, it's got a lot of glitz on it, a lot of bling, but it, 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 it is a pine tree. My point here is that with all these chords, with all the math against them and everything else, you know, all these really exotic 
you know, chords with mathematical names, at the bottom most level, they're functioning either as a major chord in the case of the Christmas tree I just did, a minor chord, or a dominant seventh chord, okay? Now I'm gonna give you an example of why this is true. If I have a C major seven chord, uh, how do I, you know, the, this video kind of reverse images everything, so where I would normally go in one direction, I, I you know, you know what I mean, I'm just, it's like reversing the image, so I don't know what's what. Okay, so here's a, a major, C major chord, and I'm gonna uh, play the London Bridge, London Bridge is falling down. Oh, sorry. Works perfectly fine. Now I'm going to extend C to C major 7. Works perfectly fine. Now the next one, I can't play the melody and the chord together. That's C major 9. We can't do the 11 because it sucks. So we'll go up to C major 13. Yeah, it begins to sound like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I get that. But that, that's, uh, that's the nature of these chords. They're, they're fat, they're fluffy and pillowy and soft. Okay. I think I've covered everything I wanted to cover today. This is, again, I wanted to make this a half hour video. We're into 41 minutes. Uh, I hope I don't have to apologize about that. I hope you guys find this interesting and you've learned something. Please do. I love your comments. I, you know, especially love to hear when somebody says, "Hey, you know what? The the lights went off, and I, lights went on, and I I, I understand what you're saying, and I, I'm gonna go mess with this stuff." Remember, music theory is is a, a tool for improvisation, composition, and analysis. Why does this Beatles song sound so great? Well, you can talk to me about that for analysis. Okay. Uh, composing tools. That's obvious that these are composing tools. And then when you understand harmony, you know what scale to deploy against a certain chord uh, when you're improvising. So the music theory helps in all those areas. Okay, you guys, look, it's a couple of days before Thanksgiving uh, for you American uh, viewers. And uh, there's a version of Thanksgiving in Canada, I know, uh, for you guys. Happy Thanksgiving. And uh, we're heading into the holidays, uh, so let's have a, a merry time of it. Take care, and I'll be back soon. Bye-bye.